Hi again, Jay. This is our second chat, and this time I'm going to question you about a conflict you've been studying for quite some time, the war on Yemen um, in the southern part of West Asia there. Now, I want to start off by just asking you to explain what links there are between the war in Yemen and who is driving it, the links, I mean, with the region, with the other conflicts in the region. How can you put it in context of the region and explain who or what is behind this conflict? Sure. So um, I, I guess the, the immediate answer to that question would be Saudi Arabia, the United States and the United Arab Emirates. They're the main drivers of this war. Um, but it's also inconceivable that these Gulf states could launch this war if the United States uh, did not want them to. So the Saudis claim to be acting on behalf of the official government in Yemen. And the, the, the official line is that they're suppressing the, the Houthi rebels and they need to do this because the Houthis are backed by Iran. As for the region, um, I guess a lot of these wars began in the post-2011 period, what I call the post-2011 Arab Spring Wars. Um, and essentially, these wars were, uh, were about Turkey and Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood Alliance attempting to bring um, Muslim Brotherhood parties to, to power using protests and elections. And it had different um, uh, um, results in different countries. So in Syria, they attempted to have a staged um, you know, a series of protests and demonstrations, but ultimately it, it, ha it ended up being militarized. And so these... these Armed uh, insurgents took took up took up uh, took up arms against the state. Uh, similarly, in Yemen, uh, there was a Muslim Brotherhood um, uh, faction within Yemen known as the Islam Party, and they were the ones that were that were initially demonstrating, and there was they were making some headway. Um, <clears throat> but what ultimately happened is that they became politically sidelined because they supported a candidate that wasn't ultimately popular with the population. And then there was the Ansarullah movement that came to the fore. And because they did have the support of the population, they were able to take power in a relatively bloodless process. And um, this, this is in is 2015. What, this right? is back in 2015. Um, so I say that the reason why I say that the United States has been driving this war is because after Ansarullah took power, they and Saudi Arabia have worked very hard to try and dislodge. Ansarullah from power because they established the Ansarullah movement established the National Salvation Government shortly after coming to power in 2014 actually in 2015 is when the war started so the yeah. Saudi intervention in Yemen really an invasion began in March 2015 and I think, I think you pointed out in other articles or interviews that um, what happened in Yemen when with Ansarullah was that uh, they uh, secured a very large defection from the army. What yes. the Muslim Brotherhood groups in Ye Syria had tried to do but failed, they actually succeeded in uh, in Yemen. Can you explain that? Yeah, so if you wanted to um, uh, look at it this way, um, if you wanted to compare Syria and Yemen, uh, like I said, both countries witnessed anti-government protests in 2011, the so-called Arab Spring. So the poor and the working classes, they demanded anti-corruption measures, they demanded anti-poverty measures, they wanted economic reforms to, to ease the inequality in both of these countries. Um, but there are, but then comes the major differences between the two. So in Syria, the government responded by addressing the economic grievances. Uh, they, they reformed the political system to end the constitutional hegemony of the, the Ba'ath Party. They, they um, uh, authorized transfer payments for the poorest families. However, the Muslim Brotherhood was excluded from the political process because the new constitution retained a clause which banned uh, religious parties from contesting elections. So naturally, this, in, this annoyed those in Syria with, uh, with Islamic politics, particularly Sunni Islamic politics, given that they are the religious majority in Syria. But instead of, um, of, of asking that that clause was removed, they took up arms against the state with the backing of the United States, Turkey, and the Gulf monarchies, most, most notably Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Um, now, they tried to get large defections from the army. That's on right. The basis that's right. That the army was mainly Sunni in Syria, but failed. I think there might have been a, a few thousand, perhaps, but, but relatively small percentage of a, quite a large army. What happened in Yemen in this respect? What happened in Yemen is that um, the, the army defected to the side of Ansarullah. Um, so Completely or partially? The overwhelming majority of the army defected to the side of Ansarullah. A few brigades remain loyal 
to uh, the former government and generals like Ali Mohsen al Ahmar who opposed Ansarullah taking over. Um, but yeah, in, in Yemen, the so-called rebels are 100% indigenous. There's no, there's no uh, doubt about that whatsoever. Um, so well, that's another this, factor, isn't it? Apart from the defections in the army, um, there's, they don't have any substantial foreign component fighting with them against the Saudis and the others. No, no, and that's the big irony, which is that the official government in Yemen, that is the government of uh, Abdul Rahman Mansour Hadi, uh, that official government is overwhelmingly dominated by foreigners. <laughs> Um, so if you just look at the, the, the number of foreign troops that, that's, that's fighting in this war, there's 150,000 Saudi troops, there's 6,000 Emiratis, 6,000 Sudanese, 2,100 Senegalese, there's Blackwater mercenaries, Moroccan troops, Qatari troops, although the Qataris uh, withdrew in 2017, and the Sudanese have been withdrawing since October last year. Um, there's the Egyptian Navy, and on top of that, you've got the Anglo-American Alliance. They're making money by selling weapons to the Gulf monarchies. And the Saudi Arabia is paying for it. They're spending $200 million every day um, to defend the so-called official government of Yemen, even though this so-called official government is overwhelmingly made up of foreigners, whereas the so-called Iranian-backed proxies that they're fighting are 100% indigenous Yemeni. Now, this official government, the Hadi government you're talking about, or pseudo government, where is it based? It's based in Saudi Arabia. Are there any, uh, are there any bases within Yemen itself? Uh, there's, uh, there are some uh, militias in Yemen that are loyal to the Hadi government, but um, you can't trust what they have on paper because on paper it says, oh, they've got tens of thousands of people. But on the ground, if you look at what's actually been, been transpiring there, all you see are, are mainly mercenaries, Al-Qaeda mercenaries, ISIS mercenaries. Um, there's uh, Islam militias, there's warlords. So outside of the areas controlled by Ansarullah, there's basically warlordism and chaos, whereas under the, un, un, under the Ansarullah-backed National Salvation Government, you have order. You have some sense of order. I mean, the population is starving, and that's horrible. But um, you have the, the trappings of a state. It comes across as the rightful successor of the Yemeni state, has defected to the side of the revolution. That's what's now happened just, in Yemen. Right. Now, I just want to go back a couple of steps uh, the point you made just uh, perhaps uh, went over rather quickly before, and that's the question of the autonomy of the Saudi regime, basically. Now, um, the Obama regime, the Trump regime have sold hundreds of billions of dollars of weapons to Saudi Arabia, but you make the point that they're not really independent. They can't act as independent players there. I think Trump said not that long ago, maybe a year or two ago, that this, if the US didn't support the Saudis, they'd be gone in 24 hours, something like that. I think he was right in that, basically. What is the, how do you characterize the, the autonomy or the lack of autonomy of the Saudi regime in Riyadh? They've got a lot of money, they've got a lot of weapons, but uh, in terms of their political stability, what, what would you say about it? Well, I mean, Saudi Arabia, you only have to look back at its history to realize that it's a that it's an artificial construct. Um, the Saudi regime has its origins in the Nejd region, which is in central um, Arabia. It's landlocked. Uh, historically, it hasn't really been the basis of any civilization. Um, it's mainly just been very tribal. Um, there's been warlords there. And the reason they were supported by the British initially is because of their you know, in the words of Winston Church, Churchill, unfailing loyalty to us, that is to the British. And so a country like Yemen next to Saudi Arabia also poses a civilizational challenge because Yemen, unlike Saudi Arabia, is, um, is far more secure in terms of what its borders should be. Um, and so Saudi Arabia is a very insecure state for this reason. If you look at the uh, northern part of Saudi Arabia, the eastern provinces, you have a largely Shia population who have been brutally persecuted by the Saudi regime. Um, they have, you know, children on death row for protesting. Uh, that's how insecure they are about their um, their ability to rule that area if they don't crack down with that much violence. Then you've got the uh, the coast of Saudi Arabia that faces the Red Sea, which is uh, where Mecca, Medina, Jeddah, those cities are there. Historically, that was Hijaz. It was controlled by the Ottomans. It was not controlled by the Nejd. The Nejd took over it in, in by the course of an invasion. And then in 1934, um, the, the Saudis, uh, with the backing of the British, they invaded the provinces of Baha, Asir, Jizan, and Najran, which are historically Yemeni in the sense that if you were to ask the indigenous population who are living there, um, which country do you feel like you're closer to, would it be 
Yemen and uh, the people in Sana'a, or do you feel closer to the people in Riyadh, they'd most likely say the people in Sana'a, because that's where they're culturally closer to. So Saudi Arabia is a highly artificial state, backed by the US and Britain. Well, going back, using that and going back to my original question, who's driving this war, people start with Saudi Arabia, but given what you're saying, isn't it more correct to say that this is a US-driven war using their puppets, the Saudis? Yeah, yeah, I would, uh, I'd say that. In fact, um, there's... And if that's um, the case, why? Why is the US so intent on getting rid of this Ansar Allah-led government? What, what's the point there? Why, why are they so intent on funding that terrible war? I think the main reason for that is because Ansarullah represents the, the possibility of Yemen becoming an independent country again. So let's look back at history. Back in 1977, uh, Yemen had an ind North Yemen had an independent president and South Yemen had an independent president. Now, this was uh, not the way that history was supposed to go for the Americans because the United States is really inheriting the geopolitical position of the British. Now. The plan originally after World War I was that Britain would control the south of Yemen and the Saudis would gain control of the north of Yemen. But that failed because the Yemeni resistance back then in, uh, in the 1930s under Imam Yahya Hamid al-Din fought the Saudis to a standstill and that's why they were able to secure the current borders of North Yemen with Saudi Arabia. Otherwise, the entirety of northern Yemen would be under Saudi control today. It's because of the, the steadfast resistance of the Yemenis that it's not a part, not a part of Saudi Arabia. So, um, in 1977, uh, this is a very important period in time because you've got the growth of Arab nationalism um, across the region, especially with uh, President Gamal Abdel Nasser. And um, in the context of Yemen, by, 19, by the 1970s, there had been another coup d'etat in North Yemen which brought to power President Ibrahim al-Hamdi. Now... We now know that Saudi Arabia was behind the eventual assassination of, of President Al-Hamdi in 1977, which then paved the way for the 34-year reign of the former president Ali Abdullah Saleh. And under Saleh, the, the influence that Saudi Arabia was able to exert over the Yemeni state multiplied. Um, and that was like a major threat that was staved off. So what happened in the South is also interesting because... Previously, you had a socialist government, which, like all of the other countries where you have socialist uh, governments, it collapsed after the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union. And um, the, the reason it, uh, it, it collapsed is because the Saudis um, started backing al-Qaeda militias to essentially colonize the South. Um, so uh, Ansarullah represents an attempt to, to reject this Saudi Wahhabization of, of Yemen. So they emerged so, in the uh, 1990s. Yep. I keep coming back to this theme then, the driver of the war, because the Saudis are a cat's paw. If they're the puppet yeah. there, then, you know, a lot of people have said, oh, well, the war in Iraq is because of control of oil and the war on Syria is because of uh, gas pipelines and so on. People had looked for a simple sort of one factor element there. Now, in Yemen, uh, although Yemen does uh, has exported uh, oil and gas in the past, it doesn't seem to be a major factor. What would you say? What What is it that irritates the U.S. so much about Yemen or about an independent Yemen? You're right. It's not just about oil. There's also geostrategic factors, like the fact that uh, Yemen straddles the, 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 the Bab al-Mandeb Strait, which is where 21% of the global oil supplies flow through. Um, and the United States um, is also worried about strategic geography. So it's not just about going into a country that has lots of oil. It's also about the countries that surround the countries have, that have a lot of oil. Uh, as you know, ever since 1976, the US dollar has been substantially backed by, by oil sales by way of the petrodollar. And so the, the idea that Yemen could become an independent country again is is something that's very worrying to the United States because let's say let's have a look at these these current wars that we've seen Saudi Arabia has exported uh, terrorism to all of the countries in the region where they want to topple the government now let's suppose Yemen was a self-defining independent country with a strong economy um, uh, decent living standards and a strong army it would probably be very difficult for Saudi Arabia to get away with something like that so strategically it's very important to keep Yemen poor Okay, now looking at that coalition arranged against Yemen, against what I think you've described as the only real revolution of the Arab Spring in the last decade, basically, 
Um, there was this coalition, a little bit like the one used in Syria, that is to say, a coalition of Wahhabis from, based from Saudi Arabia and the groups that they supported, and the Muslim Brotherhood um, network, which um, was centered on Turkey, one, one stage included Egypt and included Qatar. Now, that alliance between the Muslim Brotherhood groups and the Saudis fell apart a few years ago. Can you explain a bit about that and what the tensions were between the Muslim Brotherhood group and the, the Saudi uh, former partners? Well, I think, first of all, this difference uh, between them goes back um, uh, to, the, to the 19th century because the Muslim Brotherhood, they see their patrons as, as Turkey. They see Turkey as the, the seat of the former caliphate and their rhetoric is about resurrecting the caliphate. Now, the Saudi Wahhabis, by, by comparison, they, uh, that state, the Saudi state, began initially as a rebellion against the Ottoman Empire. Um, and so there are those historic tensions about which of these two countries, Turkey or Saudi Arabia, is going to be the, the leader of the, the Muslim Ummah, to use their language. So the, the split is really that, um, that in the case of... Um, uh, in the case of the uh, of, of Saudi Arabia, sorry, in the case of um, Qatar and Turkey, their plan with the Arab Spring was to try and support political protests in the form of color revolutions, hoping that this would sweep away the governments that they didn't like, and then they would have loyal Muslim Brotherhood governments taking power in Syria, Egypt, and also Yemen. Okay, but that completely failed. So when that failed, I think that's when Saudi Arabia started to step in with their counter strategy or their plan B, which is, okay, let's just arm and fund the most anyone, like no matter how radical they are, be it Al-Qaeda, be it ISIS, right? And then you started to see, in the case of Syria, for example, the, the, the power relations between the Free Syrian Army and Al-Qaeda started to shift drastically in favor of Al-Qaeda from about 2012 onwards to the point where talking about the Free Syrian Army after that became irrelevant because they were totally subordinated. And so... That's when you start to see, you know, the the, the influence of, of Saudi Arabia taking uh, priority over the interests of the, the Muslim Brotherhood axis. So there are competing interests there. They're not all just the same. You've got loyalty to Turkey versus loyalty to, um, really, I mean, the, nobody's loyal to Saudi Arabia. None of these um, these Wahhabi groups will say, yes, we love Saudi Arabia. They all hate Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Well, they did work to, except the ones that take the Saudi money. Yeah. Um, I mean, they did, they did work together for a while, and the Saudis were involved in the beginnings of the conflict in, in providing arms to Dara, for True. example. But they were never keen about Morsi, the, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, brief president in Egypt. They had a pretty good relationship with uh, his predecessor. So why, how would you explain that in the same way, the fact that the Saudis were very, if not uh, antagonistic, at, at, the, at best indifferent to uh, Mohammed Mursi when he was president of Egypt. I think it's because they have uh, contradictory interests with uh, with Turkey. I mean, wh while at the same time they have a common interest in fighting against the resistance axis countries, Iran, uh, Syria, and, and attempting to dislodge Hezbollah from Lebanon, at the same time they're competing with each other. So there's also uh, oil and gas interests here because Qatar um, has a shared interest with Iran insofar as there's a there's a there's a region of natural gas in 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 the Persian Gulf that they're both sharing, and so that but, means but, that but was using its its media channel Al Jazeera to call for genocide against minorities and against Shia. You know this was um, you know they they were as vicious as the Saudis in a lot of their ideology. Yeah, true, true. Um, I just I just think it's um, uh, the. I'm. I'm not saying that like one is less vicious than the other. I think that the that the the plans were very different. So the initial plan was that you would have. Um, uh, the idea was that you know Muslims can be democratic too. You know Muslim political parties can come power through democracy. Um, now the I think. Brotherhood, you yeah, the 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 Muslim Brotherhood could do this. In in Syria, um, that failed, so they turned to Al Qaeda and ISIS. In um in the case of Egypt, uh, I guess it's just that Saudi Arabia considered. The, the status quo to be preferable to the Muslim Brotherhood uh, coming to power. Um, and they were quite jealous of uh, Al Jazeera, didn't they? Al Jazeera has been a successful sort of Western populated media channel and the Saudis set up Al Arabiya in type of competition, but it hasn't got the profile that Al Jazeera has either. No, no, it doesn't. Um, I mean, Al Jazeera, I think, is, is really resting on the laurels of its historic reputation because initially they had a lot of like decent Palestinian 
uh, professionals who were working. And then over the course of the war in Syria, they started getting rid of a lot of uh, a lot of their own staff started um, started quitting because they they saw that they were being um, being asked to to pump out lies. Well, so, that brings us yeah. up to I mean uh, to bring this to a head. There was an extremely violent reaction by the Saudis again, or the you know the 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 clown prince, MBS in Saudi Arabia to Qatar, who had been their partner, you know maybe their junior partner in the terrorist wars against Syria in Iraq, and against Yemen too. Now, to what extent was Yemen a factor in this? What were the major factors in the the, the Saudis having this very violent reaction and trying to? trying to bring Qatar to its knees and of course then actually as it happened forcing Qatar into the arms of Iran I mean what was about what was behind that fallout do you think um I guess with uh, with with Yemen um, it would be because the 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 solution that the that the Qataris had in mind of like the the Muslim Brotherhood essentially seizing power de uh, democratically didn't work um, and but I don't think the fallout I think basically Qatar reacted to the fact that they were being punished by Saudi Arabia by pulling out of the war in Yemen. That's what happened in 2017. They no longer wanted to participate. And ever since then, Al Jazeera's line on Yemen has been relatively reasonable compared to the positions they've taken on Syria. Um, mm. So I guess I guess it's, uh, yeah, that's more about the differences between, um, between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, which I'd have to look into further. I think the um, the murder of that uh, Saudi journalist too in Turkey. I think uh, it seems like he had been shifting to the more North American position, Muslim Brotherhood position, more or less. Mm, it, it, mm. Is that how you'd see it? <laughs> What's his name? The, the, uh, the Khashoggi. Khashoggi was he? What was he? Perhaps identified with the Muslim Brotherhood um, groups there. <clears throat> well, he was about to marry a, a Turkish woman, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, I mean, I um, I don't fully remember that case. Uh, what I what I remember about Khashoggi is that he was uh, starting to raise criticisms of Saudi Arabia's foreign policy, particularly in Yemen. And he was saying, well, you know, initially he was he was uh, supportive of the war, but then he started turning against it. And yeah, I think it was basically because he was uh, sympathetic to the wrong axis towards you the, mean the war on, you axis. Mean the war in Yemen. The war on yeah, Yemen. the war on yeah. Yemen. I think he was starting to raise criticisms of it. Um, yeah, I mean, he was still overwhelmed. He was supportive of the war on Yemen initially. That's definitely now, the case. Now, in in the international debates, let's say the European and North American ones, you have um, there hasn't really been a huge obstacle to the portrayal of the war on, on Yemen being a humanitarian catastrophe. In fact, the, you know, from, it's more that they've ignored it. But from time to time, these stories come out. I think the Europeans, maybe even the US, have condemned you know, the, the violence in Yemen. Um, but somehow or other, they've managed to escape uh, direct involvement, even though, as you pointed out, the Saudis and also the British, and I think the French also, and the Australians, by the way, have been selling weapons to the Saudis and to the Emiratis in that respect. How do you think they've got away so for so long with simply trying to push off the war on Yemen as a humanitarian disaster on the one hand, but somehow it has nothing to do with the uh, with the the role of the of the big Western powers behind the Saudis and the Emiratis? Well, it's relative. So, for example, um, Yemen has received uh, considerably less coverage uh, relative to Syria, for example, and uh, the reason for that is because in Syria. You have to demonize the government. You have to put in a lot of effort and a lot of propaganda to demonize the government in order to ultimately overthrow it. Now, that failed. Whereas in Yemen, there is no conceivable humanitarian pretext for why Saudi Arabia and all of the mercenaries that it's effectively purchased, numbering at around 150 to 180,000 mercenaries, should be deployed against a country like Yemen, uh, inflicting... Uh, what is it, like five years of mass starvation where 68% of the population is starving. And that's according to the United Nations as well. There's no humanitarian pretext for this. Whereas in, in Syria, the, the path towards regime change was by constructing all of these elaborate humanitarian excuses for why um, the, the war on Syria is justified, why we should so arm the so-called freedom fighters uh, in order to topple the government. So, yeah, in summary, in, in the case of Syria, you have to talk about it in order to achieve the objective, whereas in Yemen, to achieve the objective, you have to pretend it's not happening. 
the only real demonization of the effective government in the capital and and uh, in Western Yemen has been um, to say that they're linked to the Iran or puppets of Iran in some sort of way. Or um, how, how would you explain the relationship there? Clearly, there is a relationship. I yeah. mean, Iran does certainly give a lot of media attention. At one stage, they were probably the only media group in the region giving substantial attention to Yemen. But how would you explain that relationship between Iran and and, uh, and Yemen? Yeah, well, I mean, there's uh, there's no... The, the thing is, the, the pretext for the war against Yemen is that Saudi Arabia is helping the official government um, uh, to, to, to fight Iranian-backed proxies referring to the Houthis, even though the Houthis are 100% indigenous Yemeni, and the Yemeni army who they fight alongside are, again, 100% Yemeni. And the accusation then is that um, the, the Houthi rebels, quote-unquote, really the National Salvation Government of Yemen, is receiving arms from Iran. But how can that be the case if there's this brutal blockade? If the majority of the Yemeni population is starving because food isn't getting in, what are the chances that weapons can get in, especially when you consider that all of the shipments of food that arrive in on, on uh, to the um, to the ports in Hudaydah, they're they're stopped by the Saudis and they're checked uh, over and over again for weapons to the point where the food rots and by the time it enters Yemen, it's completely spoiled. So there's no there's no um, uh, physical there's no real physical transfer of weapons. I mean, there might be, but it's not something that we can really um, point to. The Yemeni army and the National Salvation Government and the Ansarullah-led national resistance relies on stockpiles of Yemeni weapons um, that are taken from the Yemeni army. That's where they get their weapons from. I think it's one one point that's missed by a, a lot of commentators is that they see Yemen as a starving country, but not as a, a, a very highly populated country with a population greater than Syria, greater than Iraq and with significant technological capacity. They've been building their own drones, yep. their own weapon systems and so on. Can you say something about the technology and industry in Yemen? Yeah, so uh, in September last year, there was that um, the, the drone strike that uh, took out uh, the Saudi oil facilities in Upcake. Uh, that was uh, Yemeni's uh, you know, uh, reverse engineering um, missiles and drones by themselves. Um, so despite uh, all of the pressure they're under, they managed to, to pull that off, which is quite impressive. Now, uh, another question that arose from what you were saying was that the, the Saudi side, uh, as by way of justification for the war, are saying that they are supporting the legitimate government. Now, can you just explain the convoluted logic that's behind this? How do they say that this guy who's living in Saudi Arabia and apparently doesn't have much of a say in what they do anyway, um, how is he... How are they pretending that he, uh, Hadi, is the, is the legitimate president of, of Yemen? Where does that come from? Well, th well, they're not even pretending anymore because all the discussions that they've um, that they've had uh, with um, like on Yemen have completely sidelined Hadi. Hadi hasn't really said anything <laughs> over the course of the entire war. And back in twenty in twenty seventeen, we heard via Al Jazeera and uh, the Associated Press that um, President Hadi had been kept under house arrest in Saudi Arabia. So th to give to give the audience an analogy, that would be a, a little bit like uh, President Bashar al-Assad of, of Syria being held under house arrest in Tehran or, or Moscow. Um, so he's under house arrest. He doesn't say anything. And not only that, he resigned. So the, the idea that he's the, he's the official president makes no sense when considering that in February 2015, he resigned from his post. It's not even like Ansarullah um, seized Sana and then kicked him out of office or tried to persecute him. What happened is that Ansarullah um, seized power in Sana with the backing of the army. The army said that they were acting in the general interests of the homeland. And then Ansarullah demanded that the president, that is Hadi, implement uh, the um, um, some changes, right? So, for example, under Hadi... Uh, they were planning on federalizing Yemen into six pieces, which would have um, greatly enhanced autonomy for the regions of Yemen that are sparsely populated but have like 80% of the natural resources, particularly Hadramut. And that's something Saudi Arabia wants. Saudi Arabia has always wanted direct access to Hadramut without having to negotiate with the central government. And then Hadi also um, uh, uh, raised fuel prices because he got rid of the subsidies um, and so fuel prices uh, skyrocketed by 190%. So Ansarullah came to power and they said, these are the changes you have to make. You have to 
re reinstate the subsidies and you have to get rid of this nonsense of trying to divide the country into six different pieces which only benefits foreign powers particularly saudi arabia um and so now, because he wasn't state... because because hadi wasn't able to live up to these ultimately nationalist demands um uh, he resigned and then the same day that he arrived in Riyadh, that's when Saudi Arabia began its in intervention. But Hadi at one stage had some sort of mandate, didn't he? Let's put aside the resignation for the moment. He had a temporary mandate of some sort, didn't he? What, what was the mandate he got? The mandate that he got was to preside over the National Dialogue um, uh, Conference. So to, to basically bring the different uh, factions in Yemen together. So you've got the Southern Movement, you've got Ansarullah and the Islam Party, as well as the, the, the General People's Congress, which is the party of Ali Abdullah Saleh. And the, it was an attempt to try and work out the differences between these, between these factions. So, for example, um, the Southern Movement, they want greater autonomy for the South, which is fair enough. Um, if you look at their history, I can understand where they're coming from. Um, of course, they've, they've gone to the, to the point of, uh, of supporting the UAE, occupation of their own country in order to 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 get that but initially Ansarullah was uh, was warm to the idea of having a federal solution between north and south but instead the the solution that that Hadi ended up pushing through um, which wasn't really that popular uh, was the the six-way federalization um, ultimately benefiting Saudi Arabia okay so in any case whatever mandate he had has long since run out basically, yeah. you're saying. Now, there's, apart from Qatar being expelled from the coalition there and living in this uncertain sort of space where it still has its relationship with Turkey, but it's also got this new honeymoon with Iran in some sort of way, um, there's tensions between the Emiratis and the Saudis, right? Can you explain the differences that the Emiratis have? You think they're a relatively small group to, to the Saudis, but um, what's going on with the tension between the UAE and, and Riyadh? Initially, they were on the same team. They wanted to uh, get rid of the Ansarullah-backed government and put Hadi in power in, uh, in Sana'a. But when that failed, um, the UAE started supporting the Southern Transitional Council, which is remnants of the, the Southern Movement, or basically the Southern Movement. A lot of its socialist uh, characteristics have, have disappeared. Um, so what the UAE wants to do is basically break up Yemen into a North and a South. So they're saying to the Saudis, you can take over the north, that's your responsibility, we'll take control of the south. But the problem for the Saudis is that they can't dislodge the Ansarullah government in the north, which controls the overwhelming majority of the north now. And so now the Saudis and the Emiratis well, that, are fighting for control. What's the areas of the north, you mean? You mean the populated Yeah, yeah, well, 82% of Yemen's population uh, live in, in the northern part of Yemen, the northern wedge of Yemen. And so Saudi Arabia, in failing to take over northern Yemen, find themselves fighting with the UAE for control over the South. Right. And at the moment, are they still working together or is, has there been a withdrawal of the Emiratis? Uh, the Emiratis have um, like uh, withdrawn in part, um, but the they're basically not fighting each other. There have been clashes in the past where um, Saudi-backed troops have fought against uh, Emirati-backed troops, but the Emiratis basically just control the... Um, the city of Aden. They don't really control the rest of the country. Large but parts that's, of uh, that's the finance. The central bank's in Aden now, isn't it? That's right. That's right. So the 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 bank of the the government is in Aden. So there's a bit of a problem there. So I mean, ultimately, um, big whatever. Well, big problem because ultimately it means that Saudi Arabia has to pay out of their own pocket because they don't control the central bank. That's that's in Aden, which is why Saudi Arabia spends two hundred million dollars per day on the war in Yemen. But the, in Sana'a, in the capital, they can't pay salaries and they can't uh, pay for foreign importations too because without access to the central bank. I mean, isn't that yeah. a huge part of their uh, of the siege problem that they it's, it's the block, once the blockade of ships, but the other thing is they haven't got control of the finances. They've got control of the capital, but not the finances. That's right. That's right. They're, they're, they're basically just holding on and making do with what they have. It's a very desperate situation. Now, there's something else with the Emiratis that's interesting at the moment, because the way I read Trump's latest um, economic siege measures against Syria under the so-called Caesar Act, which is a part of another omnibus act that just got passed through, it's effectively ramping up third party sanctions uh, on, on third parties who do business with Syria. 
And to me, it seems like because there's already there's been severe sanctions on Syria for at least eight years, I think now. Um, but it, it seems to me like Trump is trying to aim at the Europeans on the one hand and the Emiratis on the other hand, because the Emiratis have re-established relationships with Syria, with Damascus, mm -hmm. with Bashar al-Assad, and they've also started to invest significantly in the country, which the two are connected, of course. Now, I think Trump is trying to, you know, attack the weak spots, uh, the weak allies, the Gulf monarchies that might want to start doing business with uh, Syria. Um, what about Yemen? How does it affect this, do you think? Are the, the, have the Emiratis given up on the idea of partitioning Yemen or what is their role affected by this split it seems Cu to be a wide split currently they just uh, they they just control Aden that's um that's that's as far as I know um but beyond that I'm I'm not too sure um uh about the the further developments in the tensions between the UAE and Saudi Arabia but they but they certainly exist I think you'd you'd perhaps know more about this than me but uh, there were also talks at one stage, um, I think hosted by Oman, between the Saudis and Iran. What happened to those? Because I think the Saudis were on the back foot a while there after their big refinery was attacked and they were looking under the hammer, more or less. There were some, definitely some feelers opened up and some people were, were travelling between the Saudis and Iran. Uh, did anything come of that or did it just fizzle? Uh, it's it fizzled. I think it's um, it it hasn't really gone anywhere, from what I can tell. But it was a sign of weakness on the Saudi part, wasn't it? That they really they weren't advancing, and they were looking for some way out. It seemed to me. Yeah, I mean the the big weakness for Saudi Arabia is that they can't put together um, an entity called the Yemeni government, or at least pretend to put one together that can come to the negotiating table with the National Salvation Government, which is actually a government. That's the big problem that they have. Um, it would be it would have to be a direct uh, discussion, and and that's actually been been entertained. A direct discussion between Saudi Arabia and uh, the the National Salvation Government is probably how it will it will end up being. Well, I think the the attack on the Aramco it wasn't just a question of the oil production because the Saudis are really uh, in financial problems, and they were wanting to float um, their oil conglomerate basically and get in foreign capital there it, it significantly devalued that operation there um how do you see that affecting saudi resolve at the moment uh, have they pulled back in in their uh, in their support for terrorist groups in syria and other countries while this uh while this failure is going on in yemen as well well it seems like they have because um i mean with syria i think the the plug was uh, was substantially pulled um, back when Trump came to power because the CIA stopped funding the, the, um, the so-called moderate rebels. Um, and uh, I think ISIS, because ISIS has been, has been more or less eradicated, um, it would be kind of a, it wouldn't be very smart to throw money at that. Um, and in Yemen, they're just hanging on. It's, it's gotten worse for them because like the, the, the Sudanese have started to pull out as well. So, yeah, I mean, we can only, we can only wait and see. And at the same time, there are more direct talks between Yemen and the resistance groups in, in, other, in other parts of the region. I might add Libya too, by the way, where you have a significant Muslim Brotherhood group there, but there's the, the, national, the more nationalist uh, version over there has been talking in Damascus. Uh, the relationship between Yemen and Iran has been a bit more open. What do you see about the possibilities for Yemen in terms of linking up to the other independent um, peoples and states in the region? Are they are they taking on a, a more international internationalist profile these days? Um, <clears throat> what I what I can tell is that uh, is that they that they're open. They have a very kind of um, uh, pan-Islamic um, uh, solidarity message, but also Arab nationalism is a is a major part of their their strategy as well. So unite the Arabs and then and then try and build solidarity with the Muslim world. Um, so what what comes of it? I'm not sure. That's I'm not consistent. Sure. With, it's consistent with Iran, isn't it? Basically. Yeah, yeah. It's consistent with Iran. I mean, they they seem to have like a lot of um, like they, whenever something happens in Palestine, you know, like the Yemenis are protesting about it, right? So yeah. it seems like Yemen cares a lot about the Arab world and the Muslim world, but there's not it's not reciprocated, um, because the the Arab and Muslim world uh, are largely influenced by the Gulf countries. And so they're worried about taking the, the right position on Yemen.
why is it why is it so important to the Yemenis? The Yemenis have in in part of their well, Ansar Allah has in part of its motto, "Death to Israel." You know, why is Israel and Palestine? Why is Palestine so important to Yemen? I think it's because they see Israel as being being a part of the American alliance. Um, and in fact, it, it's become more overt over the past few years that Saudi Arabia and, and Israel have a, have a collaborative relationship. Um, and so if Israel is, uh, is, is undermined, if not uh, forced to make major concessions to the Palestinians, it can only be beneficial to all of the independent countries in the region. I think there was a famous uh, song from Yemen about our enemy is America. They didn't have the illusion that even though they're fighting the Saudis and their mercenaries, but they saw it very clearly, uh, the hand behind there. And you think they see Israel in the same sort of way. They see Israel as, uh, you know, the cat's paw of America in the region. Is, is that? I think so. I think it? so. I think you can divide the the Arab world into, into countries that, um, uh, that are, you know, directly controlled by the United States. And the, the republics tend to be a lot more uh, independent by comparison. So Yemen, Syria, Egypt, Libya, what they have in common is that they, they were republics, whereas the monarchies by comparison um, had no pretense of democracy, no pretense of representing uh, the people even within their own borders. And to the extent that they did, it's because they were able to buy them off with massive amounts of oil wealth. And so I think there's potential there for these republics coming together um, and, and eventually forming an alliance against the monarchies. I think that's certainly on the cards like it was during the Cold War. Well, in Egypt, they overthrew a monarchy, but they become very dependent on the Saudis mm. and the US. And do you see that there's something substantially different about Egypt there? A lot of people are very hopeless when they look at the situation of Egypt or the Egyptian government. Yeah, I mean, I uh, Egypt isn't really my focus because there hasn't really it didn't really result in a war um, in a in an open conflict like what happened in Syria. Mm. Um, but at but the I moment, think... they, have a role, they have a role in relation to Yemen, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they have a role because the, the Egyptian navy is deployed against Yemen. So they're, they're directly involved in, uh, in, in, uh, in the genocide of Yemen. That's, that's certainly true. Um, but I think that role is not because the, the Egyptian people or the Egyptian government even um, has anything against Yemen. I think it's purely because of their relationship with Saudi Arabia and the United States. They, they're essentially selling themselves. They see it as a business deal. Um, because Egypt has become economically reliant on foreign loans and aid and, and support from Saudi Arabia and also the United States, they kind of have to play ball. Um, whereas Syria, by, by comparison, despite being um, uh, a sanctioned country, despite having this horrible predatory war being waged against it, it's got a relatively independent economy. They're, they're self-sufficient in the production of a lot of things. Whereas Egypt, I mean, part of the reason why the protests of the original Arab Spring were, were so vocal in Egypt is because the food crisis that happened in 2008, 2009 caused food prices to skyrocket in Egypt because they relied uh, substantially on, on imports of grain because of the dependence that they had, um, that they had uh, uh, found themselves in because of economic policies. But uh, Egypt is a very big country. You know, Egypt, Turkey and Iran are all similar sort of size, very big countries compared to their neighbours. And if you're talking about the Egyptian people, I've seen some polls that shows that the Egyptian people are more anti-American than almost anyone else in the Middle East. You know, mm. we're not talking about their government. But at a popular level, there's a great deal of resentment about the, the, the North American role there. And then on the government side, they have taken very seriously their anti-Muslim Brotherhood uh, approach. So... Uh, that makes them, to some extent, allied with Syria, but also supporting the nationalist forces in Libya at the moment. Um, uh, they don't see a contradiction in that or uh, in terms of their relationship with Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Arabia is against the Muslim Brotherhood too, you know, when, it's, when it suits them, if it seems to, it seems to be, if, if the Muslim Brotherhood is going to help the Saudis' ambitions, the Saudis will go with it. I think that's one reason why people say Wahhabism is not really an ideology, you know, it's, it's simply something attached to a political system, basically. It's not a consistent <clears throat> ideology in the way that Salafism is a consistent sort of theology. Wahhabism is much more, what do you say, opportunistic perhaps. Yeah, well, I mean, Wahhabism um, is named after Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, um, who provided the ideology for the for the original Saudi state, and he saw himself as as uh, reviving the teachings of Ibn Taymiyyah, who is one of the most important Salafi scholars. Um, but I think Saudi Arabia's attitude towards the Muslim Brotherhood or Al Qaeda or, or 
or any uh, group like this is basically NIMBY, not in my backyard. Um, th these movements, if you look at their oh, official got ideology, for for Al Qaeda. Oh yeah, Israel. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like um, uh, Al Qaeda, if you if you if you were to um, uh, look at their their official ideology, they say, look, we want to overthrow the Saudi government as well. Um, it's just that it's not a priority. First, we have to fight the Shia, then we have to fight Iran, then we have to fight every other um, uh, Muslim sect in the in the Arab world um, that doesn't conform with our ideas. Then we fight Israel. Then maybe we'll fight Saudi Arabia. So um, you can say you can tell a lot about uh, their their foreign policy and who they're attached to by the priority of who they hate the most. Okay, well, just coming to wrap this session up, um, just to, can you give your final thoughts on uh, that fundamental question that always sort of concerns me? What's really been driving? Why is the US so keen to exterminate this little pocket of resistance in Yemen? Why is it so important to them? And, and where do you think it's going? How would you wrap up on that? Well, I think the, the United States recognizes that they are a dying empire, and so they have to hold on to, um, to all of the pieces of the puzzle. And Yemen is a very important piece of that puzzle for the for the strategic reasons that I mentioned before. I mean, look, Yemen, um, I think maybe it's also because the Saudis and the United States, they see potential in Yemen that the rest of the Muslim world and Arab world doesn't see. Yemen is an ancient civilization. It's the cradle. It's the cradle of, of Arab civilization. They are a highly um, uh, <clears throat> uh, sophisticated, intelligent uh, population and if they had the ability to escape from the the puppet rulers that have been imposed on them by the by the Saudi American consensus then they would become a thriving nation in their own right and by the way it's it's not necessary it's not necessarily the case that uh, that Yemen doesn't have um, uh, resources my guess is that Yemen does actually have something uh, does have its own resources it's just that they haven't been exploited for the benefit of yemen so according to wikileaks saudi arabia has always wanted to build pipelines through hadramaut um it's just that they've uh, they've they've had this policy of ensuring that puppet leaders stay in power in sana thereby preventing yemen from ever developing so that it remains a cheap pool of of, of mercenaries and and labor for the saudi economy and keep them weak and divided Keep them weak and divided. Divide them into six pieces. Yes, that's what the Saudis want. Okay, thanks very much for that, Jay. Thank you, Tim, for having me.